This lecture is about steering your child towards better vision, basically just an overview of children's vision. Uh, we're going to talk about what normal vision and vision development is in children and then some things that can go wrong and kind of recommendations for um, childhood eye care and some common myths and questions that people have. Um, to begin, we're going to talk about normal vision development. So when a child is born, um, our vision starts improving from birth to about age three. Um, different parts of vision develop at different rates. So if you think about vision, you see shapes and colors and movement, um, contrast, stereo vision, which is like 3D vision. All of those things kind of develop separately um, and at different rates. And so usually the vast majority of this development takes place in the first year of life. Um, when babies are born, uh, they're born with a wide range of what we call refractive errors. So that's like being farsighted or nearsighted. Um, so they can be all over the place when they're born. But that first year, they move towards what's called ametropization, which is basically moving towards not having any prescription left in their eyes. Um, so they're moving towards zero, so towards nice, clear vision. Um, stereo acuity, so that's your 3D vision, that's one of the later things to develop, so getting good depth perception takes a little bit of time. We have to have both eyes seeing well and working together to have that happen. And then during this time, your brain and eye coordination is developing, so your eyes don't work independently, they have to form connections with the brain, and the brain has to learn how to see, how to interpret what the eyes are bringing in. Um, so that happens as well in those first three years rapidly. Um, now we'll kind of go through what can go wrong. Um, so the most common thing that goes wrong with vision in children and in adults is what we call refractive errors. Um, a lot of us wear glasses or contact lenses or have had you know, LASIK or something like that to correct for refractive errors. So there's three basic types, uh, which some of you guys are probably familiar with. The first one is myopia or nearsightedness. Um, that's a difficulty seeing far away. So in children, about 5 to 30% of children um, will have some amount of nearsightedness. It really depends on the population of people, the ethnicities, where they're located. In the United States, it's somewhere in the mid to upper 20% of children. Um, Asian com countries typically have the highest rates of myopia. Myopia typically develops in middle to later childhood, so we're thinking um, older children going into adolescence, when children go through puberty, they often develop nearsightedness. A nearsighted eye doesn't see well because it's too long, so if an eye that grows too quickly or too much um, will become nearsighted. Hyperopia is the opposite, so that's farsightedness. Um, it's a little harder to understand. Typically, when you think about farsightedness, you think about trouble seeing up close, which is part of the problem, but really it's an eye that's too short and the eye muscles have to compensate by focusing. Um, they can do that up to a certain amount. So in children, our eyes can focus, um, they can kind of force the vision to clear up and, and compensate for some amount of farsightedness. Whether they can do that for a long period of time is variable. Basically, you're having to work an eye muscle to try to clear your vision, um, both at distance and even more so up close. And so sometimes that vision can come in and out of focus. It can be clear part of the time, not clear part of the time, but it's not quite as straightforward as, as nearsightedness where you just can't see far. Um, this occurs more commonly in younger children. About 5 to 17% of children have significant farsightedness that needs correction with glasses. And again, that depends on the population of children that you're looking at. Um, typically this is younger children. As the eye grows, because farsightedness has to do with an eye that's too short, a lot of times kids will outgrow some of this farsightedness um, so that they will, uh, eye will get closer to the length that it should be. And then the third type of refractive error is astigmatism. Um, this one always sounds like a disease to people, but it really just has to do with the shape of the front of the eye. So if you have a perfectly round surface of the eye, we're talking about that kind of clear cover over that goes over the colored part of your eye, the cornea. If that's perfectly round, like a, basically like a basketball, um, you'll get a nice focal point where things are clear. If it's a little bit more oval, kind of stretched out like this, you're going to get some distortion in your vision. So it kind of causes your vision to be stretched out sideways um, or distorted. 
And, and that can happen in any direction. So this could be oriented this way or that way, and it will stretch things either up and down or side by side. Um, that can also be corrected with glasses. And about 30, 3 to 30% of children have problems with this, depending on, again, the population with Hispanic and um, Native American peoples having higher rates of astigmatism. Um, two other major concerns in children's vision are strabismus and amblyopia. And these are two of the more complicated concepts. Um, strabismus is an eye turn, which might be referred to kind of generically. That's when you're looking at someone and their eyes are not pointing the same direction. So you may see someone who has an eye that kind of crosses inward, or an eye that drifts outward, or up or down. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for these. Um, an eye that turns inward we call esotropia, an eye that turns outward we call exotropia, and hyper and hypo is either up or down um, movement of the eye. These are important to find out in kids because if those eyes are not pointing together, they're not getting good 3D vision. Also, the eye that's turned could be seeing, causing the brain to see double. And sometimes the brain will just start to ignore that eye because it doesn't like seeing double, and that can cause problems down the line. Um, eye turns in children, typically you're going to want to pay attention to how often does it happen? Is it happening every time you look at them or just when they're tired or on occasion? Does it happen when they're looking up close, like reading a book, or when they're looking far away? Um, and these give us clues to how we can um, correct or treat this. There's several different treatments depending on um, the type of eye turn. They can use glasses, prism lenses, um, eye muscle training, or surgery in some cases. So it's important that a child gets evaluated if they're over about six months old and this is still happening. First six months of life, our eyes do all kinds of weird movements that are just kind of learning how to use them. Um, Strabismus is related to amblyopia, but not always. Amblyopia is what's often referred to as a lazy eye. It's an eye that doesn't learn to see as well um, as the other eye, or as well as it should. So if we think about what we need for good vision, um, typically you're going to need a healthy eye that doesn't have any diseases. And then you need an eye that has uh, clear vision without any refractive errors in order to see clearly. Um, with amblyopia, you can get one eye that sees really well. So child's walking around, let's say their right eye doesn't have any refractive error, it sees without any problems. And the left eye is very farsighted, so that eye they would have to focus to see with. Um, what can happen is they don't work to focus one eye because one eye sees clearly and they, they don't notice that their vision is blurry. Over time, the brain only pays attention to the clear eye and it ignores that eye that has blurry vision. Um, that eye never forms those connections to the brain. So instead of learning to see 20-20, maybe it sees much worse. It just sees a little bit of shapes and it's never learned to interpret those shapes. Um, so what we want to do um, in children is discover any difference in prescription between those two eyes early and get them glasses so that they can use both eyes together and the brain can learn to use both eyes as well. Um, that way, the brain is paying equal attention to both eyes. This um, same kind of lazy eye can also happen from strabismus, which is what we call strabismic amblyopia. So like I said, if there's an eye that's constantly pointing in or constantly pointing out, the brain tends to ignore that eye because it causes double vision. And so because it's ignoring that eye, that eye never learns to be used and never learns to see well. And then the same thing can happen from deprivation, which would be the vision is just not getting into the eye for some reason. Some people are born with a droopy eyelid, the vision never enters that eye, or they may have a cataract in one eye clouding the vision, and so that eye is being blocked, and so again, the brain doesn't learn to see from that eye. So these two things are fairly common in children, probably about anywhere from one to three percent of kids will have either one of these problems, so this is something that we're on the lookout for whenever we're checking um, children's vision. And then sometimes kids wear a patch like that. That's to kind of force the eye that's not seeing as well to work a little harder. So we may have them do that for a few hours at a time. <coughs> and then there's eye health conditions, which some of which commonly happen in children, some of which are much more rare. So three of these things on here are fairly common. That would be allergies, styes, and pink eye. Um, allergies in children and adults are very common, especially in Southern California. Um, we have 
you know, windy, dry climate, the lots of things to make us itchy. Um, with allergies, typically we're going to see red, watery, itchy eyes, a child rubbing their eyes, maybe blinking frequently. Um, the good thing is they're easy to treat. Uh, we have over-the-counter eye drops that work really effectively for allergies. Uh, in children ages about three and up, we have safe medications. Um, and then in younger children, cold washcloths, um, just gently using artificial tears or wiping off around the eyes can help. Occasionally, allergies are severe and they can cause further complications in the eyes, so it's always a good idea to get them checked out and figure out what the most appropriate medication is. Um, styes, styes is kind of a common word for what we call a hordeolum, which is a swelling in the eyelid. It's kind of like a pimple of the eyelid. We have oil glands on the top and bottom. Um, bacteria builds up in one of those oil glands and it gets swollen, inflamed, red. Um, those especially common in kids. Kids are not good about washing their hands, not touching things that they shouldn't, and then rubbing their eyes. So commonly happens, they're easy to treat, usually with a warm washcloth compress a couple of times a day. Occasionally they need antibiotics, though, so always a good idea to get that looked at. And then I'm going to skip to pink eye, which is the third fairly common thing. If you've been around kids, you've probably seen one with a pink eye at some point. Um, about 90% of the time they're viral, which is just like a cold that got in their eye. So it could be they had a little cold and it did get in their eye. It could just be an eye virus that travels eye to eye, doesn't actually make them sick. Um, but they spread easily from person to person and they cause discomfort, red, pink eyes, wateriness, but they go away on their own. Occasionally pink eye can be caused by bacteria and you usually get kind of mucusy, gunky, sticky discharge and in that case they may need antibiotics. Um, biggest thing with pink eye in kids is just good hygiene, so washing hands, not sharing towels, being careful, it often spreads to other members of the family. And then these three things, cataracts, retinoblastoma, and retinopathy of prematurity are much less common. Um, but they do happen in children, I'm sorry, and glaucoma as well. Uh, we'll start with glaucoma. Glaucoma in children is very rare, and um, children with glaucoma have a very distinct look that's usually seen at birth. They have very enlarged eyes. Um, they almost look like a cartoon character. They have big, round um, corneas. It's not something that your child's going to develop um, suddenly later on in, in their childhood. So it's something that they're born with and typically requires immediate surgery to reduce eye pressure. Um, but it is something that we occasionally see in children. Glaucoma itself is, an, is a, bigger a bigger set of conditions, um, more common in older adults. And so that's something that's routinely checked at both children and adults' eye exams. Um, they, check eye pressure and do a quick check of kind of their field of vision to make sure they're not missing signs of that. Cataracts are also something we typically think of in older adults. Um, that's when the pupil becomes cloudy. So the lens in the eye will start to cloud behind. Um, it may look yellow, brown, white, something like that. It is found most commonly in older individuals. So all of us are growing cataracts throughout our lifetime and they start to become noticeable as an uh, older adult, usually 60s, 70s, 80s, something like that. But children can be born with cataracts, which is much less common, but it does happen. Um, they can be caused by infections that the mother may have while the child's in utero. They can be caused by trauma. Um, they can sort of happen spontaneously, rarely as well. The important thing if, if a child does have a white pupil like that is to get it looked at because it could be blocking the vision. It may need to be removed if it's significant. The other thing that can cause a white looking pupil is retinoblastoma. Um, that's a pretty serious thing, but luckily very, very rare. About 200 cases a year in the United States and that's a childhood cancer of the eye. Um, it's oftentimes genetic. A lot of times one of the parents will have had it. And it can be treated successfully if it's um, discovered early. So children should be routinely screened for eye health. And then if you ever do see a child who gets a reflex like that in a picture where their pupil appears white, that should definitely be checked out. And then the last thing here um, is retinopathy of prematurity. That's a condition that happens in premature infants, typically those born before 32 weeks of age. Um, it's a condition where the retina is not fully developed. 
So retina is one of our last things to develop in our body, and that's the lining of the back of the eye. Um, over during um, gestation, it slowly grows blood vessels and kind of spreads throughout the back of the eye, bringing what does the seeing of the eye in. Um, if the child's born premature, that may not be fully developed. The problem becomes um, these children are usually given oxygen shortly after birth, and oxygen is a factor that um, spurs excessive blood vessel growth. And so they'll get bleeding in the back of the eye, um, they can get a retinal detachment, which can cause the eye to become blind. Um, but this happens less commonly than it used to because we're more aware um, that excessive oxygen at birth can cause this and they now use lower levels than they once did. Also, if your child's born premature, they'll be screened for this. It's something that's done routinely and it can be treated if they catch it. Um, and then one other thing that is common in children and in adults, but typically discovered in childhood is color vision deficiency, um, or formerly called color blindness. Um, very common, especially in boys, it's a genetic condition that's carried on the X chromosome, which means that it's typically spread from mother to son and kind of skips generations. So grandpa will have it, mom carries it but doesn't have any problems, and then her son will have it. Um, there's two different kinds of color vision deficiency. The one that's genetic and common in boys is the red-green color deficiency. Um, less common and more likely to be caused by some sort of uh, eye disease is blue-yellow color deficiency, and that typically develops um, later in someone's life. Red-green, which is the most common one, um, happens in about 6 to 7 percent of boys and 1 in 1,000 girls. Um, by ethnicity, we have different prevalences with Caucasian boys being the most frequently affected by color vision problems. Color vision deficiency also comes in different um, severities. So we have three cones which do the seeing of fine details and color in our eyes. Um, most people with color vision deficiency also have three cones just like someone with normal color vision, except they're shifted. So they see color in a slightly different spectrum than someone with three regular cones would. So it's not that they don't see colors, but they may see something like this looking a little bit more like that. More severe forms are actually missing one of those three cones, and that's less common, um, but causes more significant distortion in colors. And these people typically mix up like khaki, brown, green, orange, beige, kind of colors in those spectrums. They're not going to mix up, you know, your fire engine red and a Christmas tree green, but those more subtle shades will be difficult to distinguish. Um, major considerations for this is just knowing that they may not match colors well in preschool and kindergarten the way other children might, um, and that certain jobs do require perfect color vision, so they need to be aware going into their future. Um, if, you know, a certain military or police type career appeals to them, they may not be eligible. So now, after all the things that can go wrong, um, how do we prevent it or how do we, you know, catch these things early enough to treat them? So recommendations for eye exams um, for children. So every eye exam for a child should be a comprehensive dilated eye exam. That's when they put drops in to open the pupils, check the health inside the eye, as well as get an accurate look at prescription in their eyes. The first eye exam should be between 6 and 12 months of age. Parents always tell me, this is so young, you're going to put drops in my baby's eyes. But actually, we're looking for all of those big things. So we want to make sure there's no cataracts, there's no any rare forms of cancer or anything strange in the eye. And we want to make sure their eyes are not turning in or out at that point, um, and that they don't have a very significant prescription that may cause amblyopia or a lazy eye in the future. We want to make sure those eyes are pretty even and in a normal range of prescription. Babies are actually really great for eye exams. Um, they typically like to stare at lights. They are easy to put eye drops in. They're not very mobile. Um, obviously, we can't get them to tell us anything, but they do a really good job sitting still for the most part. Second eye exam should be around age three, so entering preschool age. At this point um, is when we expect vision to be at adult-like levels. So we want to check 
Typically with a cooperative three-year-old, we can get a lot of information by this point. We can usually get them to match shapes, um, give us a good visual acuity. We actually expect 20-20 vision by age three as long as we have good cooperation. Um, and at that point, we can make sure that their vision is in a normal range for an older child that's starting to learn to use their eyes in school. Um, and we may prescribe glasses for somewhat smaller prescriptions than we would at a year old. Um, third exam should be around age five. That's entering kindergarten for most children. At that point, we want to make sure they're ready to learn. They're going to start taking in a lot more information through their eyes, a lot smaller things, um, learning to read, making sure they're comfortable seeing smaller print, um, and again, checking for things like eye turns and other eye problems at that point as well. And then continuing exams every year from about age six to 18. Obviously, if we discover a child with an eye problem, we're gonna see them more often than this recommendation. But if your child's normal, not having any issues, that's what they should be seen. I'm gonna go through some common myths about children's vision. Um, Working with parents is tricky sometimes because a lot of times they're worried about the first one, that the glasses will make their eyes worse. Um, this is not the case. Actually, undercorrected um, vision often leads to worsening faster. Um, so the child's eyes are having a hard time reaching that normal range and if they're moving in the wrong direction already, um, not wearing those glasses may drive the eye to get even worse quicker. Um, and also, a lot of times glasses will make the vision better. So in the case where a child has a big difference between those two eyes and we're worried about a lazy eye, um, putting glasses on them will help them be able to prevent problems down the line. So get both eyes learning to see and making those brain connections appropriately. We basically have the first six to seven years of life to prevent um, amblyopia, so that eye that doesn't learn to form those brain connections correctly. So the sooner the better as far as getting glasses on kids that need them. And about 20% of preschool age kids um, do need vision correction in some form, and it increases going um, as the child gets older as well. The second myth I hear is um, parents worried about their children reading in the dark. So kids see in the dark a lot better than we do. Their pupils are bigger, their lenses are clearer, they have better contrast sensitivity than we do. So typically, Children and young people um, see just fine in the dark. They don't have to, doesn't strain their eyes. It's not gonna make their vision worse. I tell people it's like listening to a whisper. It might be hard to hear, but it doesn't hurt you. Same kind of thing. So it might be hard to see, but it's not gonna hurt your eyes. And then the last commonly heard myth is that children don't need sunglasses. Um, this is not true. Most of our sun damage happens in the first 15 years of life. Um, again, our, our pupils are bigger, our lenses are clearer, we actually get more sun into our eyes as a child than we do as an adult. Um, getting kids to wear sunglasses might be another story, but if you can, it's important. And then this is a big one, which is technology and children and adults' eyes. Um, so we use technology a lot more than we did in the past. And our eyes are biologically designed um, for spending time outside looking far away. They're not really designed to be reading for 8 to 10 hours a day, which a lot of us use them for. So it puts a strain on our eyes, especially our children's eyes. Um, there's a couple of things that can help. One of them we call the 20-20-20 rule. So this has to do with just good vision practices. So typically if a child's reading on an iPad, on a cell phone, computer, anything that's up you know, within arm's range, um, want them to take a break every 20 minutes, um, take 20 seconds to look 20 feet away, give those eyes a break. So the more we can break that up close focusing and let those eyes focus far away helps um, reduce eye fatigue and also increasing nearsightedness. So a lot of us um, and our children have increasing problems um, seeing at distance because we spend so much time up close. We think it drives our vision to kind of set to where we're normally using our eyes. and so. A lot of people are concerned with children's increasing nearsightedness. Um, the other thing is spending time outside is good both for children's health and for their eye development. Again, our eyes are designed to be outside looking far away, so their studies have shown that spending time outdoors in the sun um, does help keep nice normal vision um, and reduce the need for glasses in children. 
Another thing with technology is blue light and bedtime. So blue light is a big topic right now. Um, it's the kind of LED light spectrum that's emitted from our phones, our televisions, and a lot of our kind of overhead lighting these days. Blue is fine. Blue light's found in the sun and outdoors, um, but it has to do with our circadian rhythm, so our sleep-wake cycle. Blue light tells our brain, hey, it's daytime, stay awake. And so when we're on our devices at night, laying in bed with blue light in our eyes, it says, hey, it's daytime, stay awake. So our brain doesn't get the signal to start shutting down, basically. So children who are on this, you know, close to bedtime may have a harder time falling asleep um, or staying asleep. There are a lot of things out to address this problem at this point. Um, most of us have, you know, iPhones or smartphones. They have a color shift that you can set to happen at nighttime. Um, so it may turn your screen kind of more yellow. That helps block some of that blue light, so that's recommended. Um, and there's also glasses coatings these days. My glasses actually have it on there, and it, it has kind of a blue sheen to it, and it helps cut down some of the blue light from electronics. Um, and then the last one is dry eyes and the computer. And this, again, is a problem not just for children, but for everyone. A lot of us are on devices, electronic devices, computers, for a lot of the time, and we don't blink as much when we're on the computer. We tend to stare. We're trying to get focused on that contrast that's different than um, natural lighting, and it makes our eyes dry, red, irritated, burning. So you may notice your child blinking a lot um, when they've been on a device for a long time. Um, again, try to take breaks, and then they do sell like lubricating um, tear kind of drops that you can use on occasion as well. And then the last thing I want to talk about is just um, what we're doing here at UCI with children's vision. Um, so we have three main um, locations that we do see children at. One of them is our pediatric eye mobile, which I am affiliated with. Um, the other one is our optical shop, and the last one is just our comprehensive ophthalmology services. So our eye mobile is affectionately named Seymour. Um, it's a mobile clinic that sits in our parking lot. Uh, has two exam rooms in it, and we drive it all around Orange County. We coordinate with local preschools, Head Starts, Boys and Girls Clubs, things like that, community clinics. Um, and we either provide screening or a nurse will provide screening. And if the child fails the screening, um, me or our other doctor will see them for a comprehensive eye exam and free classes if needed. So mostly serving uh, lower income families in Orange County. But our goal is to identify problems um, in this kind of critical age period, get them identified, get them on their way towards treatment, and at least plugged into the community where they can continue care. Um, we have our optical shop here at UCI. That's our comprehensive optometry service, um, serving both children and, and adults. And this is typically ages about five and up, given the tools that they have with them there. And we sell, you know, glasses, safety frames, sports goggles, contact lenses, and just your general eye care for those who are healthy and not in need of specialty or surgical services. And then we have pediatric ophthalmology, along with a whole host of other specialties here. Um, but we have several doctors, and they manage more complex cases, so disease con conditions that need continual monitoring, um, cases that may need surgery, and children with special needs um, who have you know, a whole host of other issues going on, um, they typically manage those cases. Most of the time it's just irritation. If you have very severe dry eyes, it can put your eyes at risk for infection or kind of um, other types of degeneration of your cornea, but typically that's someone who's had severe dry eyes for many years, so usually that's in an older patient. <laughs> so those are a little bit, they're sort of pseudoscience. They increase contrast, so they don't give people true color vision that someone without color vision deficiency would see, um, but they can help shift 
the light a little bit so that they have an easier time distinguishing between different colors. So it's still gonna be not quite true what we expect a normal person without color deficiency to see, but it can help sharpen some of those color differences. They're typically like a red lens and it compensates for some of this green shift that people with color vision have, color vision deficiency have. So it's not necessarily, you're not gonna pass your color vision test with them. Basically you're not gonna pass as a normal, but you can um, maybe function better in certain situations. really <laughs> yeah most people function fine so most people don't have too many issues except for maybe matching you know some kind of colors that are fairly similar um, but a lot of people live a long time without realizing they have color vision problems and they do fine so it's not usually that big of a deal there are severe cases where people notice a bigger difference um, but there's currently not any treatment doesn't hurt you, but you just have a harder time doing it and you typically don't want to. You can wear it all the time, so it's just like an anti-glare, but it does help soften the screens. Um, it doesn't change too much like your color perception or anything like that, and a lot of our overhead lighting is, is that blue light as it is. Um, some people don't like to wear them if they are going to be out in the sun during the day because they like to get that signal that, hey, I'm awake. It, it, you still get light around your glasses and things like that, but they, they don't hurt you to wear them all the time. Typically not. So it depends on the type of prescription you have. So that's someone, something you'd have to talk to your doctor about, basically. Um, but for most people, no. Um, so cheap sunglasses can be okay, um, but they have to have a sticker on them that says, it usually says UV 400 um, or 100% UV, and those mean that they're blocking 100% of the UV rays up to the 400 range. Um, if it doesn't have that sticker, it actually can be worse for your eyes. But most even inexpensive glasses that you'd find at Walmart or Target will have that sticker on them. Um, I don't know about dollar store, but usually if you're buying like a $10 pair of sunglasses, they're typically going to have that protective value. If not, what can happen is you're, you block some of the light, your pupils dilate, but you're still getting the UV radiation, which actually causes more damage. Yeah, so in nearsightedness is usually what people are worried about progressing, because that's typically what get, gets worse as a child grows. Um, there are some things that are proven to be beneficial, um, and it's something, again, that would be a conversation with your doctor, but there's kind of three things out there that um, have been proven to be effective. One of them is multifocal contact lenses, which are soft contacts that are actually designed for older people who can no longer focus up close, um, but they've been shown that if children are put in those, it can help slow down progression of nearsightedness. Um, the other one is an off-label use of a drug called atropine, which is actually a dilating eye drop, and they use it at a very, very low dose. Um, it reduces the eye's ability to focus just a little bit, and that, for whatever reason, we're not entirely sure why has been shown to reduce nearsightedness as well. And the third one is ortho-K lenses, which are overnight wear contact lenses um, that help they basically flatten the surface of the eye overnight so that you don't have to wear glasses during the day. And those also have been shown to slow down the progression of nearsightedness, but there are risks with wearing contact lenses overnight, including eye infections and scratches and things like that. So they're all things you have to kind of weigh out with your doctor. Prescription. Again, that really depends on the person's eye. Um, so with LASIK, you have to have thick enough front surface of your eye um, to do the surgery. And how much surface has to be taken off depends on how high your prescription is. So the higher your prescription, the lower your likelihood of being a candidate for LASIK. But it also depends on how your, your eye itself and what the anatomy of your eye is. So, um, you know, I would say most people under minus six can be safely done on average. After that, it becomes dependent on the person. Um, and 
Some people will just want some of their nearsightedness gone. If we can take them from a minus 8 to a minus 2, they're much happier. So even sometimes partial LASIK helps, but something that's kind of person-by-person person specific. Thank you guys for coming. Enjoy your night.